Our senior staff team here at Christ United has been studying a book called Dare to Lead. You may have heard of it. Uh, You may also have heard of the author. Brene Brown is a research professor at the University of Houston, where she holds an endowed chair in the Graduate College of Social Work. A popular speaker, author, and podcaster, Brown's career really took off with her 2010 TED Talk about the power of vulnerability that became one of the most popular TED Talks in history uh, with more than 52 million views to date. I was first introduced to her work in a Texas Methodist Foundation leadership cohort with other uh, Methodist pastors, and I think she has important things to teach us about healthy ways to show up in the world. Leadership in the church has always been daunting, ever since the women encountered the risen Christ at the empty tomb on that first Easter. Each generation has its own unique challenges. In our generation, uh, we face the declining influence of the institution of the church, as well as this highly polarized public discourse. Seems we have a hard time agreeing on much of anything these days. Not to mention the the previously unimaginable disruption of the pandemic. And so the senior staff's conversations about Brown's latest book have been incredibly helpful as we dream about and plan for what comes next for our congregation. And there was a section of the book that I found to be particularly clarifying for me. Brown asks her readers to to write down the values that we hold dear, and she offers a long list of of common values shown here, which includes spaces for write-ins. If she didn't include the particular values, maybe that that the reader found important. And she says that most people uh, typically name somewhere between 10 and 15 values that are most important to them. And she says that it's okay to begin by identifying that many values that are essential to us. But then she insists that her readers clearly identify their two core values, not 15, not 10, not five, not even a Trinitarian three, which is usually my go-to, two. Two core values that guide everything else in our lives, the two values to which every other value has to be subordinate. Because, according to Brene Brown, that kind of clarity is essential to living a life of meaning and purpose. She writes, Our values should be so crystallized in our minds, so precise and clear and unassailable that they don't feel like a choice. They are simply a definition of who we are in our lives. In those hard moments, we know that we're going to pick what's right, right now, over what is easy, because that is integrity. Choosing courage over comfort. It's choosing what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy. It's practicing your values, not just professing them. She says that our our core values are the beliefs that are most important and dear to you, that help you find your way in the dark, that fill you with a feeling of purpose. Now, if you've never done this exercise, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. There are lots of values that that most of us consider to be important, values that we find to be essential, values that that help shape our character and guide our decisions. But in the most stressful moments, when values uh, conflict or when they compete for our time and attention, having that kind of clarity about the, the two core values that define who we are and determine the next right thing to do in difficult circumstances, can mean the difference between remaining true to who we are and who we're called to be or surrendering to some lesser good or worse, compromising on on matters of ultimate importance. And my experience is uh, that it that takes some, some time, it takes some work to narrow down the list of worthy, important values down to two. What would be your two core values? 
This is the fifth and final week of our Lenten sermon series, Promises, Promises, focusing on the concept of covenant in our faith tradition. Throughout Lent, uh, we have been following the recommended lectionary texts, exploring the various covenants that God has made with God's people throughout our salvation history. So far, we've covered the covenants with Noah and Abraham in the book of Genesis. Uh, We've talked about the covenant with Moses from the book of Exodus. And then last week we talked about the covenant with Christ, but we talked about it in the context of a story that Jesus references from the book of Numbers. Today, as we close this series, we're staying in the Old Testament, reading an important passage from the prophet Jeremiah. In the Old Testament, uh, there were two significantly defining moments for God's people. The first was the Exodus, when, when God delivered God's people from slavery in Egypt. God called Moses to lead God's people out of Egypt to the Promised Land. Uh, And shortly after Pharaoh's army was destroyed in the Red Sea, God formalized the relationship with God's people at Mount Sinai. The law of the covenant that begins with the Ten Commandments was our subject uh, in week three of this series. The second major defining moment in the Old Testament was the exile. When Babylon conquered Judah, destroyed the temple, leveled the city of Jerusalem and took significant numbers of our faith ancestors into captivity. It is impossible to overstate just how traumatizing this was for God's people as they wrestled with this catastrophe theologically. Our faith ancestors came to believe that the exile uh, was God's punishment for their not having lived up to the terms of the covenant with God. They came to believe that because they had failed to uphold their end of the relationship with God, the exile was the consequence of that failure. God raised up two great prophets during this era. Ezekiel uh, did his work among the exiles in Babylon, while Jeremiah did his work both uh, in the years leading up to and during the early years of the exile at home in Judah. He endured what those left behind in the ruins of the Promised Land endured. A fascinating character about whom we could devote an entire sermon series. Uh, Jeremiah is an essential figure in our faith history because it is through him that God makes a promise that continues to echo down through the ages into our own lives today. So this is the, the Old Testament lectionary text for today from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. We'll be reading verses 31 through 34. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's an old model of psychology called the four stages of competence. It's been around for about 50 years, and it's a helpful way of understanding uh, the process of acquiring a new skill. You may be familiar with this model. The first stage is unconscious incompetence. (laughs) This is the stage where we don't know what we don't know. The second stage, conscious incompetence, is when we realize that a particular skill exists and that we don't have it. 
If we're interested in acquiring this new skill, we begin to take steps to eliminate our deficit in knowledge, and we typically make plenty of mistakes along the way. The third stage, called conscious competence, is when we've learned how to do something that we previously did not know how to do, but at this stage, to use that skill requires a significant amount of concentration and energy. The fourth and final stage, unconscious competence, is the gold standard. It's when we've, we've mastered a skill and we can typically uh, do this skill, do this thing without thinking about it. So the classic example of the four stages of competence is learning how to ride a bike. We begin life and we spend several years unconsciously incompetent, which is to say uh, we have no idea what a bike is and we don't realize that we're missing out on anything. And then one day we see other kids riding bikes and we ask our parents to teach us how to ride. It takes us a while to get the hang of it. There's plenty of falling down and picking ourselves back up again. And then once we learn how to ride a bike, it takes a, a lot of mental energy early on. After enough practice, riding a bike becomes such second nature that we even have a phrase in English to describe it. It's like riding a bike, which means that we're so uh, unconsciously competent that we never forget how to do it. Back when I was a youth minister, I thought that learning how to play guitar would be career enhancing. <laughs> I wanted to be the, the cool youth guy who could pull out the guitar around the campfire or fill in with the praise band in a pinch, like our pastor of youth and family ministries, Paul Maletic, for example, can play the guitar. I was consciously incompetent, never having learned how to play any instrument before. And so I went to Guitar Center down on 635. I bought a reasonably priced left-handed guitar because I'm a lefty. And I was gung-ho for a few months, okay, for a few weeks, <laughs> about learning how to play. At one point, I could kind of play the chords of one worship song, almost reaching the cusp of being slightly consciously competent in this one specific song. But for going on 17 years now, to the consternation of my wife, Whitney, my guitar has taken up space in various closets in the five homes that we've lived in since, as a, as a dusty monument to my consciously incompetent musical ability. And our son, Max, uses the, the music stand that I bought way back before he was born for his much more competent French horn playing. All of that is on my mind as we wrap up our sermon series on the concept of covenant in our faith tradition. It's not that our relationship with God is a skill we develop. Instead, it's that these four category descriptions kind of correlate to our faith development. You know, at first we don't know what we don't know, and then we realize that there's a lot for us to learn about Christian teaching and the Bible and worship and our various spiritual disciplines. And then we develop proficiency in the various areas of our faith until one day we realize that things that used to puzzle us or intimidate us have become like second nature. It's not that we have all the answers, mind you, but our faith just becomes part of who we are. Ideally, it's just how we show up in the world. Which brings me back to our passage from Jeremiah. These are some of my very favorite verses in the Old Testament, partly because I love Jeremiah's passion and his courage and his resilience remaining in Jerusalem through those tumultuous final days before its destruction, discerning a hopeful word from God when he could have been forgiven for thinking that things were hopeless. And partly because these verses clearly point to a promise that we believe was fulfilled in Jesus, a new covenant that Jesus himself referenced on the night before he died, revealing that the new covenant was fulfilled in him. The days are surely coming, Jeremiah promises, when the covenant 
that relationship agreement between God and God's people, the relationship agreement that began with Noah, was called into being in Abraham, was codified through Moses at Mount Sinai. The days are surely coming when a new covenant will be written on our very hearts. The days are surely coming, Jeremiah predicts, when that relationship will be so much a part of who we are that we won't have to spend a lot of time seeking it and learning about it and pondering it and memorizing it and fretting about it. Because, according to Jeremiah and the verses we just read, God's people had been on their best days only what we might call consciously competent in that covenant. So the days are surely coming, Jeremiah says, when God will do something new. The days are surely coming, Jeremiah says, when our covenant relationship with God will become such an integral part of who we are and how we show up in the world that we won't have to spend an inordinate amount of mental energy and concentration on it. And what we as disciples of Jesus believe is that this new covenant is God's gift to us by virtue of our faith in Christ. The beauty and the power of this new covenant promised by Jeremiah and written on our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit is that because it's part of who we are, it shapes what we do. It influences the decisions we make. It helps determine our core values, especially those, those two core values that Brene Brown talks about, which grow out of the beliefs and the commitments that we hold most dear. And the new covenant, it, it changes us if, if we say yes to God through our faith in God's Son. During the season of Lent, the whole point of Lent is that we're called to say yes to God anew to deepen the practices that inspire the imagination of our faith and draw us closer to God, to eliminate the distractions that divert our attention from the things that we cherish the most. With just two weeks to go into the holiest day in the Christian calendar, this is a good day to ask ourselves just how fully, just how completely we've said yes to God through our faith in Jesus Christ. To me, uh, a wonderful example of unconscious competence is a a virtuoso musician. Having mastered their craft, they spend their lives devoted to it, blessing others through the gifts that God has given them. And to me, a wonderful example of a virtuoso musician is Yo-Yo Ma. Last weekend, the famous cellist uh, received his second COVID-19 vaccine at Berkshire Community College in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And during the required 15-minute waiting period after receiving his vaccine, he pulled out his cello and he gave a mini concert, including the song Ave Maria, as as a gesture of gratitude and praise. In an interview on the Today Show this week, he told Jenna Bush about an older man who brought a chair and sat in front of him while he played, socially distanced, of course. And he said that this man obviously needed something, like needed something emotionally, needed something spiritually. And he was, he was visibly moved as the most famous cellist in the world played what was almost a private concert just for him. Yo-Yo Ma said, I'm always happy to respond when people feel like they need some music. That's what I'm here for. (laughs) At this point of his life, I'm guessing that Yo-Yo Ma's cello is like an extension of his body. For virtually his whole life, music, no doubt, has come from the depths of his heart 
and soul. And God knows how many times he's played Ave Maria over the years. But for those who heard him that day, including that older man who pulled up a chair and sat in front of him, it was a a transcendent blessing at the end of what has been an unimaginably difficult 12 months. What a gift it would be if we all had that kind of clarity about our purpose in life. Uh, Friends, whatever your two core values may be, if you consider yourself a faithful follower of Jesus, I already know something about what you hold most dear. Because who we are, what we believe, the decisions that we make, how we show up in the world, all grow out of this this covenant that is written on our hearts, thanks to our faith in Jesus. May that covenant transform us. And in transforming us, make us a blessing to this world that we all share. Amen. Amen.